My Boston Celtics were the greatest team to ever play basketball. A couple of reasons. First of all, we won the NBA championship eight straight times. And to start that streak, I had four guards, four forwards, and two centers. All four of my guards are in the Hall of Fame. Well, you had, you had a great run. There's no question about that. But none of those Celtics teams could have beaten the Chicago Bulls in 95, 96. Yeah. That Chicago Bulls team that was very good? It was excellent. They were very good. Best of all time. Well, I don't think so. Remember, we had the best player of all time. I could match him. I could match him. <laughs> well, you, you, you probably could have matched any mortal player. But you're talking about Superman here. I, I, I don't even think the great Bill Russell could have matched Michael Jordan. Uh, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you would have been guarding one of our wrong. mediocre centers. In the playoffs. <laughs> they were very mediocre, by the way. Let me ask you this, Bill. What are you guys talking about? The greatest team, the greatest player, or the greatest No, we're talking about the greatest, the greatest team. Record? The team that has won more games than any other team in the world. That's all the group tries. You can't deny that because all over the world, they introduced the game of basketball, really, to the world, above and beyond the United States. So there's no other team any greater than the Globetrotters have been, and they continue to be. I used to love to watch the Globetrotters play. I, I grew up in a little town in West Virginia and used to go to Charleston when they came into town. They were really fun to play, but, you know, they're, the coach of the Washington Nationals, Red Clots, uh, he probably had the worst record than ever in the history of it. And I would say to you that maybe your competition wasn't as good. And Bill, your Celtic teams were great. Jerry, uh, Michael Jordan is an incredible player, and your team had a great run. But my choice for the greatest Laker teams uh, were the 80-85 teams. I think they're the greatest teams of all time. Expansion diluted the talent in basketball. But if you look at this Laker team, it was an all-star team from, from one to seven. And every year it seemed like we would come along and have be able to acquire someone that would make us better. Uh, you, you talked about the Bull Center, what they called it, uh, by three, committee. The three-headed monster. That, well, right. listen, this is a one-headed monster. Would have killed three of them, okay? <laughs> and, and James Worthy, Scotty Pippen was a great defender. He could not guard him. James Worthy. There's no way. And Magic Johnson, he was going to do his thing. Scotty guarded Magic Johnson pretty well. Well, he did in the playoff. But this is when Magic Johnson a little bit older and didn't have this gentleman, Mr. Jabbar, here with him. But uh, those are the greatest teams I've ever seen. They, they could win anyway just as a Bulls team, just as a Celtics team. And hey, they wait were, a minute, wait a minute. They were really good, okay? They were really good. Yeah, and you they, guys were good too because I knew you kicked our asses all the time. He had the greatest shot ever the in sky basketball. Who? No, you could not bother that, trust me. No. As great as you were, as great as you were. You know, because I'm true Blue Lakers and um, we had some wonderful teams. But I want to tell you guys about the best team you never heard of. Today, we can't even imagine sports without black athletes. Nearly 79% of players who give the NBA its enormous star power are people of color. But in the early days of basketball, the number of black players allowed to compete for national championships was zero. I find it really hard to believe that NBA players today are not aware of the fact that the NBA, when it started, was segregated. Do these young guys think they make $20 million a year because they can play? They were just born at the right time. When I came up, they said, you're going to be the first black guy in the basketball hall of fame. I was immensely insulted because all the players that played for the Reds that I knew, they knew of, they just brushed him aside. So to me, to go into a place where they had just brushed these great players aside and said, well, we'll accept you. Well, I won't accept you. I think it's important uh, for, for today's players to understand that it wasn't always like this. New York was not just a city like any other city. It was just the major metropolis of the country. And so not only did you have huge numbers of African Americans coming north and settling in what they had heard about as really the Mecca, the heaven, that was Harlem. I think of an area 
of almost a utopia of black America, you know, back where, man, if you can get to Harlem, there's so many opportunities, so many things um, that you can accomplish. The Harlem Renaissance was one of intellectual breakthrough, of artistic breakthrough, but also one in which sports was central. Yes. Because, see, the history of black people was such that for 244 years, all we had was our voices and our bodies. We had no land, no territory, we had no rights, we had no liberty, so all of our freedom, all of our self-determination was in our voices. It's one reason why the anthem of black people is lift every voice. And we had our bodies, so we could use our bodies to stylize space and time, the way we walk, the way we talk. It was time to redefine who we are as descendants of slaves stolen from Mother Africa. And this is how we define who we are in the art, in music, in literature, in sports. Caribbean immigrants were among the first to arrive. One was Bob Douglas, a native of the British West Indies. Smiling Bob was only 19 when he arrived in New York in 1901. He took a job as a doorman, and for the next four years, he worked 12 hours a day waiting for his big break. In 1905, a co-worker took Douglas to visit an upstairs gym on 52nd Street and 10th Avenue. Bob Douglas was inspired by basketball because in a basketball game you can see people's athletic ability up close and personal. When Bob walked into that gym and saw his first basketball game, he knew he had found his passion. When it's played the way it's supposed to be played, basketball happens in the air, flying, floating, elevated above the floor, levitating the way oppressed peoples of this earth imagine themselves in their dreams. Now, all he needed was a place for his team to play, and he found it right here, at this red brick building at 138th Street and 7th Avenue, the Renaissance Casino and Ballroom. The only obstacle that he had to overcome was to convince the casino's owner, fellow Caribbean immigrant, Hal Roach, that having a basketball team on his dance floor was a good idea. He finally made the deal with Roach, but he had to rename his team the Renaissance Big Five to help advertise the Ren. If the Rens were playing in the Renaissance, then he was the man who did the first naming rights deal. Some of today's biggest stadiums were inspired by that first naming rights deal that Bob Douglas put together. So much goes back to the Rens because they were, you know, they were the forefathers of our, of our organized sport in many ways. The New York Renaissance, they had a black owner, Bob Douglas, they had a black coach, and they had black players. That was the first time in the history. African-American ball players growing up think that there was always an opportunity for them in basketball, and that's not true. Bob Douglas was really at the heart of it. If necessity is the mother of invention, he had a lot of necessity, and he invented a lot of things. This is one of the ironies these days. We got a lot of black people with big money, no ownership. Right. Big cash, no control. Make big money in entertainment, but who can green light a film? Make big money in the recording industry, but who controls their master? So I think Bob Douglas, Caribbean brother, pioneer, path blazer when it comes to ownership, control, and achievement. They figured out a vision that was worth pursuing, which is the beginning of all great things. And then the tenacity and business acumen and other uh, attributes to pursue it successfully. He had a team, he believed in it, and he, and he showcased them. A lot of guys built monuments to their ingenuity, and that was his monument. The Rennie was already known for great bands and great dancing. Now they place baskets at either end. This was a dance floor, you slid, and when they moved the ball around, it was a show. People just couldn't get enough of it. It was small for me, but because they played such a, you know, a beautiful style of basketball, you, you were into the, the player movement rather than, than the size of the court. You could smell the action. As I say, you could smell the sweat. 
two guys going against each other in a confined area. You're right on top of the action. The team, when they came out, was pandemonium in the Renaissance. You see all these people in the box seats, these women and men all in their fineries to see them idolize these guys. They were like gods when they come around the Harlem community and everybody would know that they were around. Everybody wanted to meet the ball players. They represented Harlem. See, we weren't known as African Americans at the time. We were colored or Negroes and at that particular time, so they represented us. No matter where you played or what you did out there, if you were on the Renaissance, you were on the A number one team.